Um, today we are going to continue from chapter five, uh, but the only thing that's different today is that we're not going to have the PowerPoint um, slide with us today because of technical difficulties. But from last time, we were on chapter five, verse seven. And if you remember, um, chapter five, the theme around chapter five is faith and being occupied in riches. And basically, how do we have faith in any circumstances that we have in life? And um, the first section is mainly um, St. James, after he discusses the earthly lusts, he addresses um, the issue of being preoccupied with riches. And in this section, St. James encourages uh, his readers to be patient under suffering, uh, which has been a common theme going along, and, um, and to have faith in all circumstances. And as it, he gets a very clear warning, if you remember, from verse 5. Um, uh, a warning of a life of luxury and to be careful of that life of luxury. But now we're in, in verse seven and he says, therefore be patient brethren until the coming of the Lord. Right. And so St. James turns and he addresses his, his brothers with tenderness and, and compassion. Those who are suffering under their oppression, they should be um, the ones who are suffering under oppression from the rich should be patient. Uh, why? Because there were those in, in the congregation in, the, in that time uh, who were tempted to take matters in their own hands, right? And they would even go so far as to violently even overthrow the oppressors themselves and take matters into their own hands. And so St. James sort of kind of ends that discussion. And he says, they, they, we should wait for the, for the coming of the Lord. And he says in verses seven and eight, he says, see how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives their early and later rain. You also be patient, establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. This is in verses seven and eight of chapter five. And he's, he's talking to his people and he's saying, as, farmer, as, as the farmers, right? The ones who work in the fields, they know this. They know this idea of waiting on the Lord, right? How? They know it from their farming. Um, they know, he, St. James knows that a farmer, he waits for the precious fruit of the earth. And by being patient for it until it receives the earthly and the, and the, the early and the later rains, right? In the fall and the spring. And it's only after these rains that the harvest can begin. So if we attempt to harvest early, it results in no fruit. And in the same way, they also have to be patient and not to imagine that justice will come if they attempt to harvest the early, um, to, to harvest early by violence or revolution. And so St. James is asking them to establish their hearts and to refuse to be shaken from their stability in Christ, right? He reminds us that our Lord's coming draws near. It comes close. It's, it's near. And it'll come soon enough. Um, uh, Pope Athanasius, St. Athanasius says, who was, you know, he himself who suffered. And he wrote to the people explaining to the, the sweetness, um, the sweetness of hardships that we can face. He says, although the road of the kingdom is narrow and difficult, yet it leads to life. And when it, when one enters into it, it becomes wide and enjoyable. Again, although the road of the kingdom is narrow and difficult, yet it leads to life. And when one enters into it, it becomes wide and enjoyable. And St. James goes on to say in verse 9, Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. So do not grumble against one another. Don't ask for revenge. You know, um, why? Because this is, revenge is the work of a judge, right? And the judge is standing at the door. The day of the Lord is approaching. And as they wait... They're not supposed to groan. They're not supposed to complain against one each other. You know, during times of persecution, there's always a temptation to fight and divisions to begin. And so one commentary compared this to being like an animal who is, who is scared. And when animals are scared, they have a tendency to snap and they have a tendency to bite. If the Christian condemns, you know, um, and judges one another, they themselves will be judged. He says, behold, the true judge is standing before the doors ready to enter. And so he's saying, let them wait for him, right? Wait for the just judge who will come and he's coming soon and he will do all the judging that's necessary. In verse 10, St. James writes, my brethren, take the prophets 
who spoke in this in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. So he offers an inspiring example of suffering during hardships and, and patience. He says, let them take the, the prophets who spoke in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let them remember the struggles of Elijah, right? Who lived a life of persecution under Ahab, right? This is recalled in 1 Kings chapter 19. He's saying, let them think of the sufferings of Jeremiah, who was beaten and imprisoned and left to die. Let them remember the martyrdom of, of Isaiah, who was sawn in half, right? Despite all their sufferings, we now count them blessed, uh, the ones who persevered through such, through such things. We too will be blessed on the last day if we per persevere as they did. In verse 11, indeed, we count them blessed who endure, who have, you, who, you have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. You know, he's speaking to an audience that have heard the perseverance of Job, and they've seen the end purpose of the Lord in his dealings with him. So when Job had endured all his sufferings, refusing to abandon God, at the Lord, what? He restored him to joy. And he said that he is, um, he is a full of heart, of heartfelt love and compassionate, right? In verse 11, the word full of heartfelt love or, or compassionate in the Greek, it comes from uh, a couple of words meaning many and innards. And so the innards were spoken of as the seed of emotion. And so to love from the full heart, the full heartfelt love and compassion is to love from one's deepest heart with an abundant overflowing love, right? So St. James is saying here that God's heart overflows with love for us. And he longs to be compassionate and merciful with us, to wipe away our tears and to fill us with his joy. So we should pray that we persevere and, and hold to our faith, waiting for the Lord to bless us in this age to come, even as he blessed Job after his sufferings were over. Um, and then verse 12, St. James writes, But... Above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no, no, lest you fall into judgment. So St. James here in this next section, which concludes the chapter and concludes the letter, starting at verse 12, he begins to teach the brethren not to swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath. He's saying that God will indeed bless them at the end with his overflowing compassion, but only if they take care in the meantime not to swear rashly, right? Why? Why, did he, why was he specific about this? Because casual oaths were part of the everyday language um, in, in that context. And the Pharisee, actually, the Pharisees had a series of levels by which some oaths were binding and some oaths were not binding. For example, if you remember swearing by the temple, right? These were not binding versus other oaths that were binding, like swearing by the gold of the temple, right? If you remember this, this kind of like from Matthew chapter 23. And so the result of this legalistic view was actually, it, it devalued the spoken word and, and it made, you know, rash vows very common. So for St. James and for our Lord, right, the Christian should not, should not swear at all, but be so truthful that his yes means yes and his no means no, and that no other oaths are necessary. You don't have to swear. Why? Because you are that honest. Otherwise, what can happen? That God will hold him accountable for the oaths that were rashly sworn, and he will fall into a greater judgment. Right? So it's an, another warning. In verse 13, St. James says, Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. So now St. James urges his hearers to find their center and their contentment in God, whatever, you know, whatever the various circumstances of life will throw at us. 
If anyone is suffering, let him pray, offering his suffering to God. The, the hardship referred to is mainly that of, you know, suffering persecution. It's the same kind of language that's being used in verse 10 when describing the suffering prophets. But it also includes any form of suffering, right? So one should not pray to God to remove the hardship, but for strength to endure it and to use it for good and to purify the heart and to find the blessings to the hardships. One of God's blessings on us is that he permits us to go through the various trials and he doesn't answer our prayers right away to teach us to be in his presence. One of the fathers of the church says, do not worry nor be sad if God does not answer your prayers right away. God wants to teach you to be persistent in prayer and patient in standing before him. For what is more noble than to stand in God's presence, to talk with him and to be in fellowship with him? You know, and so he goes on to say, if anyone is cheerful and, and light of heart, right, let him sing, thanking God for the blessings that cheer him. And so daily blessings shouldn't be taken for granted, right? They should be acknowledged as gifts from God, and they should anchor us in him. We shouldn't um, get occupied with our joy, and we forget about Christ. But we use the joy as an opportunity, as a chance to praise God and to thank God, right? And then he goes on to say in the next section from verses 14 to 18, it's a little bit long, I'm going to read all of it. He says, is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with the oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. This is verses 14 through 18. Again, another circumstance, another, another um, way that we can honor God. If anyone is sick, let him call for the elders of the church, so that the elders may pray over him, anointing him with the oil in the name of the Lord. St. James promises that the prayer of, of faith, right, prayer offered in faith, will save the one who is sick. <clears throat> the one and our Lord Jesus Christ will raise him from his sickbed. If he has done sins, it will be forgiven him. You know, in St. James's day, the one who was very sick, he they would call for the priest in the city, and they would, you know, gather around him to pray and they would anoint the sick person with oil invoking the name of the lord jesus christ over him and praying for his healing you know the priest represented the totality of the christian community um why united in intercession for the one who's sick the sick one would would of course pray also confessing his sins and asking for god's mercy if he has done sins notice it's not a certainty, right? If he has done sins, it will be forgiven him. Why? The, the healing from God would come upon his soul as well as his body. You know, the practice, this, this sort of thing still happens in the church today. We know it as a sacrament of the unction, right? And because of the Lord's willingness to heal, St. James urges his hearers to confess their sins to one another and to pray for one another that they may be cured. This confession is not to be confused with today's sacrament of confession, right? And the absolution that comes. What St. James has in mind is that the sick man openly confesses his sins to God before those who come to pray for him. And, and such a confession was commonplace in the early church. In, in early church um, uh, manuscripts like the Didache, they, they urges Christians to confess their transgressions before the gathering on the Lord's day so that their Eucharistic sacrifice would be pure. And so what the Didache envisions is probably an individual confession of sins to God before coming to the church as part of one's, you know, personal preparation to gather with others in the church. 
St. James envisions a similar confession, right? A similar confession of sins on the part of the sick, but in the presence of the priest who visit him uh, to pray and anoint him. And it may be thought that the elders of the church, you know, may not be able to, to give such a cure. But St. James assures his hearers that the working, you know, the, the supplication of a righteous man has a lot of strength. The elders, you know, they may be no more holy than others. He, and he uses Elijah as an example. I love the story of, and the, the events of Elijah. He was a man with a nature like ours. And he prayed fervently that it may not rain. You know, um, as a good study for the events of what happened in, in uh, Elijah, in 1 Kings chapter uh, seven, uh, 19, it's important to know the history. If you go to Deuteronomy chapter 28, it makes it very clear that only God can give or withhold rain. And even so, even if you read Deuteronomy chapter 28, and you see that only God can give or withhold rain, even so, Elijah, a man just like we are, he prayed, he prayed for a drought, adds God's judgment on the people of Israel. And there was a drought. And actually, it didn't rain for three years and six months. An amazingly long time, right? And actually, that long time period gives proof that it was divine power. It wasn't just by chance. And it only prayed again, and the heavens gave its rain, and the earth sprouted again, only after he prayed again. So clearly, man on earth can affect much with God in heaven, right? In all situations in life, whether in hardships, in good times, in sickness, we should always turn to God, referring all things to him. And we go on to the last couple of verses of the book. He says in verses 19 and 20, Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know now, let him know how he who turns a sinner from the error of his ways will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. St. John Chrysostom says something very nice. He says, may you have this desire towards your falling uh, brothers, telling yourself that you have found a precious treasure, which is the salvation of your brother. God himself says to you through the mouth of his apostle, that when you turn a sinner from the error of his way, you will save a soul from death. This is a beautiful treasure. You know, in this epistle, uh, St. James he tackled many subjects. And really, it reveals the weaknesses of those that he was addressing the letter to, right? And to all of us. Um, like what? The love of teaching, right? The love of appearances. The love of abundant talk. Yeah, yeah, he's fine. Favoritism. Yeah, yeah. Wearing. Okay, thank you. Right? That's uh, okay. Sorry if we can mute. Sorry. Uh, sorry. Uh, love of abundant talking or favoritism for the rich, swearing. Um, but he concludes the epistle by asking them to seek the lost sheep. You know, if persecution and hardship and sickness has driven anyone among them away from God so that one actually strays from the truth, they should do all things possible to bring that person back, to win him back. The community should not simply turn a blind eye to the loss of one of their own. Whenever you see someone who needs um, spiritual or physical healing, don't say that this is not my duty, right? I'm just a layman. I, I'm just uh, someone with my wife and my kids. No, that kind of stuff is for priests and monks and bishops, right? Let the one who, let the one who reclaims his brother be assured of his reward. If he succeeds, he will not only save the sinner's soul from death, but would also cover a multitude of his own sins. St. James, he, he, he gives here, he says here that reclaiming the wandering brother is a, an amazing act and one that wins forgiveness from God. Reclaiming one's brother is a good work. 
right? To kind of go full circle of the themes of this epistle. Reclaiming one's brother is a good work. And the one doing it will be blessed in his doing, right? Origen said, actually in his commentary in Leviticus, he says, a man who converts others will have his own sins forgiven. And so I just wanted to end here that the epistle of St. James, the letter of St. James ends on a note of hope. Um, in our walks of faith, there will be many trials. He promised, you know, our Lord promised that there will be challenges. There will be persecution. There will be hardship. There will be sickness. And there will be many temptations that come to divert us from, our, from the path. Temptations um, not to, you know, actualize our faith by doing good work to indulge in sinful partiality, for example, to misuse our tongue, to fight, to condemn, to judge. But we should never veer from the true path, the narrow path, the way of repentance, the way of salvation. It, it, that path is always remaining open to us, no matter what we face. And so St. James encourages the faithful to help one another, right? To bring each other home, um, not only saving the brother, who wanders, but also winning God's grace for ourselves as well. And glory be to God forever. Amen. I wanted to open up to any um, 